Good afternoon. Around 145, including speakers, are gathered for this Decarbonizing the Supply Chain webinar. It's part of Decarbonization Week, the Virtual Sustainability Summit, a pre-COP26 event that features panels of experts prepared to share their knowledge. And that's certainly what we have here. It's the first time at virtual or in-person events that we've looked specifically at this topic. It certainly won't be the last. I'm Judith Patton, project director and co-creator of All Energy and the co-located Decarbonize. With no in-person All Energy since 2019, we've run a compelling series of webinars, 30 between May 2020 and March of this year, now 24 in Decarbonize Week. Sadly, this is the penultimate All Energy contribution to the week. Tomorrow, attention turns to sustainable oceans and on Friday, sustainable travel and farming. One housekeeping point. Audience members, check what lies behind the resources tab. You'll see what's up next. Find a full program link, the digital bag and information on next May's All Energy. 11th and 12th of May at Glasgow's SEC. That's for your diary, please. Naturally, we'd like to thank our sponsors. And for the first three days, these include our brand sponsors, Scottish Power, Shepherd and Wedderburn, and Ersted, whose names you'll see alongside certain sessions close to their hearts. And our session sponsors, Hitachi ABB Power Grids, Kellis Midstream, SSEN Transmission, SWEP, and driving the electric revolution industrialization centers. And thank you, speakers and audience members, for being with us. All webinars are available on demand, not long after coming to an end. Spread the word. Now, without more ado, I'd like to pass over to Stuart Broadley, CEO of the EIC and co-chair of the UK Energy Supply Chain Ministerial Task Force to get the show on the road. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you, Judith. And what a wonderful introduction and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we've got, um, I think, perhaps one of the most important topics of the week, uh, which is um, supply chain decarbonisation and how do we do it? Um, I think it's a kind of almost a forgotten topic, and yet it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, and some sectors are definitely further ahead than others. So absolutely delighted today to have a fantastic panel of speakers who are going to work on this topic. How do we do it? How do we decarbonize the supply yeah. chain? Uh, we will be meeting today and learning from Charles Langan from Scottish Power, Ben Walsh from Innovate UK, David Thatcher from BSI, and Kirsty MacArthur from MacArthur Green. So yes, thank you, Judith, for introducing me. I am CEO of EIC, uh, which is uh, an, nearly an 80-year-old trade association that works exclusively with supply chain companies in all energy sectors uh, to help them grow. And what we're seeing right now is that companies are increasingly export shy uh, and instead are diversifying and typically diversifying in the UK, particularly away from oil and gas into other energy sectors. Uh, and of course, the renewables, uh, so wind and solar, but also very excited about these new technologies of hydrogen and carbon capture. But unfortunately, those markets still are a long way away. So companies are struggling to diversify at scale. But maybe, just maybe, we have an oil and gas boom coming. Maybe companies will be able to fill their pockets in time to pay for this transition, this decarbonization that is undoubtedly coming. So let's hope, because companies do need to, uh, do, it's going to cost some money to decarbonize. And maybe that's one of the things we'll talk about today. My other hat is, uh, as Judith says, I am privileged to be a co-chair of, of an industry and government task force called UKESC, which stands for UK Energy Supply Chain. And it's a relatively new task force, uh, an action-oriented group made up of CEOs from key trade associations and senior civil servants from all of the nations of the UK, uh, looking at all energy in all regions of the UK with one focus to provide an amplified voice on behalf of UK's energy supply chain into policymakers. Too often in the past, I think we'd all agree, the supply chain has been a bit of an afterthought when it comes to policymaking in the energy space. And all of us now, policymakers, 
trade association and of course all the leaders of the supply chain agree we really have to get better organized at feeding our voice into policymakers because policymakers really do want to understand and make the right policies for this very exciting future that is fast approaching and so i think with that kind of setting the scene of course for the supply chain companies we need to understand what all of this means to them how do they prepare and of course how do they decarbonize so with that, we do have four wonderful speakers today, and we're going to hear from each of them in turn for about five minutes each. And then we will go into a Q&A after that. So if you are listening in, please use the platform to put in your challenging questions. Now is your chance. And we all know, we've been doing this for a while now, the more questions you get from the audience, the more interesting the discussion will be. Although I have some really tough questions I will ask anyway. So with that, I'm going to hand over first to Charles Langan from Scottish Power. Charles, are you there? I'm here, Stuart, yep. Hello, Charles, over okay? to you. Over Good. to you. Thank okay. You. Good. And I'm um, slightly worried by those hard questions coming later on, so let's let's see how that goes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So look, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, as Judith said at the beginning, we're obviously one of the sponsors um, right. of this event, and this is a topic okay. that's much close to Thank you. Up. Thanks, Tina. Cheers. Okay, um, bye now. Bye. So, um, yeah, so this is absolutely close to our heart as, as an organisation because, of course, at Scottish Power, we've been very much at the forefront of decarbonisation for the last 20 years, and just now we are the only integrated utility that has emission-free generation, and that's coming from 15, 20 years ago, when 90% of our generation was coal and gas, whereas now we've we've got no um, thermal generation at all. And not only have we have we got rid of that generation, but we've spent huge sums of money on on renewables generation to replace that. And we've now stand today with a wind capacity which is equivalent to our coal capacity back in 2006. So a huge transformation we've taken over those 15 years. Um, but that's something that we've done very much as an organisation to, to improve our carbon footprint. And over that period, we haven't focused as much um, on the supply chain. We've left the supply chain to do whatever they would see fit, whatever they saw as part of their decarbonisation um, agenda. But of course, things have moved on now. I think the urgency, the pace that's required is very much stronger. And so we're now in a situation where you know, we don't want to just be at the forefront as an organisation ourselves. We want the supply chain to be there with us. Um, but that's not easy because it's not just about decarbonisation we're going to be asking about. It's about broader ESG themes, environmental, social and governance, because you know, decarbonisation is important. But frankly, so are other aspects of the environment around water management, also social and also governance. We don't want to be working with organisations that might be very strong on decarbonisation if they've got very pure, uh, very poor records on, on other areas around um, around what they're doing. So this is something about a really holistic approach to improving and making sure that our suppliers are a positive um, influence and, and contributor to, to society at whole. Um, so, you know, that, that's where we're at. I mean, it's a big task for us at Scottish Power because we're spending now between one and two billion pounds per year. It works out about six million a day. We've got over 3,000 suppliers. So it's not a case of picking up the phone to 10 people to find out what they're doing and, and to talk to them a bit more. And of course, those suppliers range from multi-billion pound organizations down to you know one or, one or two people type organizations. So a huge breadth. So really looking forward to this session today to really talk about how you know we can help suppliers to do more, but also you know what else can be done for them around data and standards to help improve not just what we're asking for, but broader industries. And then of course, how hard can we push without decimating the supply chain? Because from my point of view, you know, from a procurement perspective, yeah, we want suppliers to do more, but but we need suppliers and we can't do it at any cost as well. So Really looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. And um, without any more, I'll pass you over to you. Okay, I think, Stuart, I think I'm next up. Is that right? David Thatcher from BSI? Yep. Yeah, great. So thank you, Charles. Um, well, the T word we hear a lot about when we um, get into the discussion about net zero, and we've actually heard already from you, Stuart, is the word transition. 
But the other key words that I think are particularly relevant are trust and transparency and, of course, tools. And BSI would position standards as the trusted knowledge tools that will enable organizations to better collaborate across their supply chains and deliver more transparent, transformative change. Um, going back to first principles, and I thought I'd take a minute of my, my short talk now to say this, a standard is an agreement on how to do something and the collective work of experts pooling their wisdom into a single document of good practice. Now, it's the job of a standards body like BSI not to be the subject matter expert on the topic, but to convene the right people at the right time, to talk about the right things. And then we oversee the open process of building consensus among a range of stakeholders that we bring to the table, whether that's policy owners in government, and Stuart's already alluded to that, the importance of policy owners in this discussion, regulators, industry bodies, academics, and also public interest groups where relevant. And this makes the final published output, the standard, all the more robust and credible. Now, standards such as those that we develop are voluntary, but they may form part of an agreed requirement of a contract between businesses, and they can be used by companies to promote to their own stakeholders how they're demonstrating a commitment to excellence. Uh, and standards can also be referenced by governments and regulation as the means by which businesses can manage their compliance. Now, such may, regulation may lay down what to do, but often fall short of providing guidance on how to do it. And this is where standards can help. They help businesses go beyond the minimum statutory requirements of the law and lay out a path of continuous improvement. So can I have my next slide, please? Thank you very much. Um, the one with the, the red, that's the one, great. Um, so um, as the national standards body for the UK, BSI believes standardization will play a crucial role in enabling our transition to a net zero economy. The necessary shift will only be possible via increased adoption of new practices and technologies, but this requires greater confidence in performance and the de-risking of investment decisions. Standards can support, accelerate, and ultimately deliver that ambition. So on this slide, I've listed um, some of the standards that are already available to support the assessment, such as the quantification of greenhouse gas emissions, reduction via greater efficiency in energy consumption, and reporting, such as an organization's claims of carbon neutrality and the use of offsetting where relevant. Um, now, don't worry about having to take down all these letters and numbers because the next slide will um, provide with you uh, access to where all this information is available in one place. So next slide, please. So from BSI's 2021 Net Zero Barometer Report, a survey of UK businesses assessing where they are on their own journey to Net Zero and what barriers they had identified, and you can download that report from the page listed on this slide, we know that whilst knowledge of the concept of Net Zero is growing, understanding its implications for individual businesses still remains quite poor. 64% of those we surveyed were not confident they fully understood the impact of Net Zero for their firm. There was a genuine desire to achieve net zero targets with seven out of 10 businesses confirming their organizations had made or were considering making a commitment to net zero. Um, energy reduction is the most frequently uh, cited measure put in place by firms to achieve net zero with 48% of respondents citing that as a key measure. But the vast majority, 82%, require more guidance if they are to achieve that target. And as we recognize that the journey through the world of standards, where to start, um, which ones to apply can seem as confusing as the road itself to net zero. We've just launched an interactive infographic which captures everything in one place. So that's where you can find through that, that URL listed on the slide. And this also provides a guide to the standards programs that we've been leading and developing support for specific sectors as they seek to, go, to decarbonize. And I think as Stuart said already, individual sectors obviously have further and faster to go than others. So we've tried to sort of segment that through this infographic and my final slide please now with ben from innovate uk coming up next i also wanted to just um, highlight and close by referencing some of the work programs that we are leading supported by the uk government and driven by recognition that innovation in this case energy decarbonization needs standards this supports the future adoption and mainstreaming of technologies that will enable supply chains to collaborate around common terminologies and best practice performance metrics. And you can see the work we're doing here on energy innovation in battery technology, um, energy smart appliances, 
uh, and also the transition to hydrogen as a source of heat as well. Um, some of these may come up in Ben's presentation as well, I don't know, but certainly that's that's what we're doing really at the cutting edge of any energy innovation alongside um, the work we're doing on the previous slides, which is more addressing uh, greenhouse gas management. So hopefully that's provided an interesting overview of our standards uh, programs um, as relevant to supply chain decarbonisation. And over to you, Ben, from Innovate UK. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and thanks for inviting me along today. Um, I, I think I'm hopefully the odd one out in the panel here, which means that I'm in a very uncomfortable position, which means I'm in the either totally the right room or totally the wrong room. And hopefully I'll explain to you why I should be here and, and, and give you some insights from, from kind of an innovation space. So uh, my role as, a, as Deputy Challenge Director for Transforming Foundation Industries is to help support um, transformation of, of six of the largest industrial uh, polluters in the country, the glass, ceramics, metals, paper, chemical, and cement sectors. Um, and they represent the supply chain. So when we're talking around decarbonizing the supply chain, those six sectors represent about 50% of all the industrial emissions um, in the UK. Um, and so if you're going to decarbonize the supply chain, that's a really good place to start because you can hit quite a large portion of that within a very short space of time. They produce 75% of the material on the planet. And, um, and as such, pretty well much any of the products or things that we use will have a significant amount of those materials in them. Um, now, I guess till quite recently, the, um, uh, the kind of the, the scientific um, uh, train of thought was very much around carbon capture and storage to help these sectors or maybe the use of hydrogen. But recently, we're starting to see um, um, kind of a transition to include things around resource and energy efficiency as, as an important part. And this is certainly something that's come out of the um, Committee for Climate Change um, um, most recent carbon budget. Now, um, undoubtedly, and the reason I'm here is, is that in order to, to kind of make that transition, innovation is going to play a key part. Frankly, you, you can't decarbonize these sectors without innovation. We, we, um, it's, it's touched upon earlier on that um, there isn't the supply chain to provide decarbonized products. And that's because you can't do it. You certainly can't do it at the scale required. And so that's where really um, we come in. And so the other thing to notice is particularly if you're going down the, the resource efficiency and energy efficiency on a system level, it's about using less. And using less is a really hard concept to understand because what you're saying to your plant managers is, is that I don't want you to produce as much stuff. And that is not how they're judged currently. Um, a steel um, firm is judged on how much steel it pushes out the back of, uh, out, of its, out of its door. If you say you want to produce less, that's a more difficult conversation. That requires use of um, customers and use of the whole supply chain in order to, um, to make that transition. And so really, I think those are the big problems around this, is that actually, you know, a lot of the technologies are unproven um, and they need some market pull and, and, com and conversations up and down the supply chain in order to do something. These sectors take decades to change as well. So this transition is going to be slow and it's going to be painful and it's going to take a lot of commitment from all sides in order to, to make it happen. And things like offsetting on this scale is just not achievable. For example, I know I talk to a big brick manufacturer. In order to offset their carbon, they would need to buy an area the size of Devon every year just to offset the amount of carbon required. So we do need to decarbonize and it's got to be a deep and fundamental change in those sectors. How are we going to do this? I think we need to engage in the supply chain. So this does require the end customers as well as the whole supply chain to be involved in this and recognize it's going to be a long-term process. And it must involve government in that conversation. And that government should be there to help de-risk that, whether that's de-risking in innovation, which I'm interested in, or de-risking in terms of standards or legislation to ensure that we've got a long-term path to decarbonizing that supply chain. And, you know, and ultimately, that change will be a mix of technologies, it will be a mix of standards, a mix of legislation, and, uh, and ultimately be about that partnership. And it's about all of us working together towards a common goal. Happy to have a conversation more around that. Um, and now I'd like to pass over to Kirsty Isla MacArthur from MacArthur Green. 
Hello, hello. I'm hoping everyone can hear me because uh, it turns out uh, yes, our cyber. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And uh, apologies for a wee bit of technical disaster stuff at the start there. Uh, it turns out our cybersecurity is entirely too tight, um, if that's a possibility. So um, that's the space that I've been operating in, and apologies for that. Um, so I am here. Thank you very much, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today to Stuart and the All Energy team. Um, I am here speaking as a co-director and owner of MacArthur Green. MacArthur Green is an environmental consultancy and we are very much representing the supplier end of the food chain in the talk today. So our team work hard to support renewables projects with ecology, ornithology and hydrology advice. But I'm not here to talk about that today. Instead, what I'm here to do is to talk to about just very quickly about our, our journey since 2016 when we have become a carbon negative business. Um, we made the decision that we were already working in the right sector. We were working in renewables, which feels pretty good because there's some fantastic work happening there to, to do our bit for the planet. But in terms of how we ran our business, there were some tough conversations that we needed to have. And with that in mind, we had to have a look at how we operated our business um, and, and the greenhouse gases that we emit, emit, emit as a business. So we felt it was time to really get into that uncomfortable space and have a look. So the first step that we took was to calculate our carbon footprint. It was clear that there were some areas that we could make improvements and, and, and we did that and, and are still doing it. Um, and after having calculated your emissions, you'll know once you measure it, you can manage it. And that was the next step for us. So we drafted a carbon management plan and, and looked at how we could take our emissions right down. Um, and, and that has been well, it's been an education, I can tell you, and we're still learning. Um, we have then looked to offset the remaining emissions that we haven't been able to reduce as a business, which has been, again, a real education piece. And, and we are now looking to share our knowledge in that space and to help others to affect more change. Yes. How people do that is going to be very different. Every supplier in this, in this conversation today will have a very unique set of circumstances that they need to address. The key change that we made, though, was we looked at vehicle usage, for example. We, um, our surveyors work in the middle of nowhere quite often and need safe 4x4 vehicles to get there. So, But we have been able to introduce in electric vehicles, for example. We have um, bought land and planted nearly 30,000 trees to offset our um, what will be over 10,000 tonnes of carbon emissions over 100 years. I mean, it's a really fantastic project. We're absolutely not perfect, so um, you know, offsetting is not the ideal. It's a part of the conversation. Offsetting is cheating, as a matter of fact, but it's a start. And, and we're proud of what we've done so far. Uh, but we're not in the business of offsetting and forgetting. For us, it is working hard to continue to reduce emissions and to keep going where we can. So we feel by operating a carbon negative business in the supply chain, it's possible to help our, our clients to to green their supply chain, to help them have those conversations with shareholders who are asking, what are you doing? Um, you know, are you are you doing what you can to reduce your carbon footprint? So, so we help make that easy. And but ultimately, you know, people want to do the right thing. So, you know, most people, you know, 99% of businesses in the UK are SMEs like ourselves. So most people want to do the right thing. And so it's it's just giving people some points of action and some references so that they can go forward and and start their carbon management journey. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here today because I think there's a real powerful piece here in what the SMEs can do, but without it being a procurement burden, but instead an opportunity. Um, every business will eventually, I believe, have to show carbon reduction. And now is the time for the large developer clients in this in this conversation to signal to their supply chain that this matters to them and to do it in a way that is supportive and a partnership um, so that we can help many different kinds of businesses and so we can get to net zero and hopefully beyond. It's ambitious, but it's also exciting. And I'm delighted to talk about our experiences further, if that helps. Thank you very much. Over to you, I believe, Stuart. Yes, thank you very much. And if I could ask um, everybody now to um, unmute as we get into the discussion and just remind everybody listening in, please do send in your tough questions. That's what we want. And I see there are two that are in there already. I will come to them a bit later. 
Um, I'm going to start with Charles, and you talked about the, the journey that Scottish Power's gone on, really ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve, in terms of moving from a from a sort of traditional you know, power generation mix to now 100% renewables. Um, why did you do it, and what's been the advantage it's provided you? To, you know, what's the business advantage that uh, you've seen from doing that? Yeah, I mean, look, right, so why did we do it? Well, I guess what a terrible pun this is going to be. We saw the winds of change, right? And the opportunities were there. And I think being based up in Scotland probably gave us a domestic opportunity um, to capitalise on, given the wind uh, speeds that we have up here. So, you know, I guess you, you go back 15, 20 years, it's easy to say that we, we had great foresight on it, but it was a strategic decision taken at that time to look it's, further. You, you, just um, so you, it's 15 years ago, right, you started. I mean, that's really before the winds of change, isn't it? So yeah, well, was it also a kind of philosophical decision or because it, it must be economically your board must have been confused weren't they back then to really is this the right decision or yeah no you're, you're right already can... seeing economically it was the right thing to do yeah and I, I, no, so you're right so the economics back then still had a question mark against them right and i can remember whiteley wind farm which is the biggest onshore wind farm in the uk it's a few miles south of glasgow that the investment decision for the board came i think in 2006 for that and that was a 50-50 decision to go to to go ahead with it, effectively. There were people around that board that were really sceptical at that time. But nowadays, if that wind farm came forward, it would be a no-brainer. Yeah, be, no, today, no-brainer. Although the margins, of course, are much tighter now. As much it's a, it's a tougher market to make money in. I guess that's another subject for another day. But, well, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the whole piece around... Um, cost reduction, right, which we've seen on onshore, we've seen on solar, we've seen on offshore wind and everything. So, I mean, I think, look, it was a strategic decision at the time. We're very much blessed to be part of the Iberdrola group and all of their um, renewables targets and what they're looking to do as an organisation as well. So this is something we've done in the UK, but the broader Iberdrola group, this is their entire agenda. And if you look at our investment across the whole group, you're talking north of 90% is in effectively supporting net zero. Yeah, we'll come back to you. I've got some more questions for you. But uh, David, we'll come to you next. Then you talked about your um, net zero survey that you did. Um, and I think it was 64% of respondents were not confident they understood the impact on their firm re net zero. Was this as a multi sector survey, was it? It was, yeah. It was a thousand business leaders, uh, pretty much every sector, and it was small, medium, and large organizations. I mean, I can, I, I, at a later time, I can go into the sort of how. No, 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 it's okay, but I just want to understand. And yeah. so, and by this, that this means then that they, 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 they hadn't thought about it, or that, so is your perception of this, people are starting to think about this, but they're miles away from understanding how radical these changes are, or yeah. is it even worse than that, that for most companies, they're putting it in the, I'll do that later box? I mean, to, to be fair and give anyone who responded that way a degree of um, credit, we actually polled people about a year ago. So obviously, you know, we know where we are now economically and in terms of the pandemic. A year ago, we actually asked one question, which is, is this something that is it was more articulate than this, but is this something that on your to-do list? But for obvious reasons, the pandemic has basically put a break on it. And a lot of people did say that. They said that both the pandemic and Brexit were acting as breaks on what they wanted to do in terms of their ambition. But I think it, it was, to answer your question, I think it was probably the second question in a way. Uh, it, it, there was a degree of un, un, uncertainty and lack of clarity. I think the very first question we asked on the survey was, what do you understand net zero to mean? And a lot of people, and I know there actually are quite a few different definitions anyway of net zero, but a lot of people were way off where they should have been in terms of understanding what it meant. Yeah, so so we're, still I, this, we're still in this basic place, arguably, of yeah. if people don't understand the language, they're not going to do it, are they? Yeah, exactly. So I think, yeah, exactly. So you could argue we're asking people at exactly the wrong time a question to do with um, you know, reducing emissions and everything actually that uh, Ben was talking about, you know, can you make less stuff with less? 
is not a maybe the, a great question to ask six months into a pandemic. But um, we're, we're, we're doing the survey again, actually, this year. So it'll be interesting to see to yeah. what extent people have started, particularly with this year being the year of COP26 and all the noise we're hearing about that, whether people are more cognizant of what net zero is and actually are starting to put together some kind of, you know, some, some building blocks in terms of what they're going to do, as yeah. we heard from Charles. Yeah. And Ben, then, so... Your argument, I think, is listening to what you said in your very interesting introduction was um, that there is no supply chain uh, yet for decarbonisation um, and there's no innovation yet for it either. So kind of the whole thing starts with we need innovation. Something has to trigger that. So there has to be a demand for it. Or are you saying it? So talk us through what you mean by this in terms of it sounds pretty bad. Like we've got no chance, right? It's a supply chain. It's not ready for it. So they, don't, they don't have the products for decarbonisation and they're not innovating in that space. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, so so I've, uh, this journey I've gone on has taken me about two years. So, so I've spent a lot of time working with the supply chain and you can do a lot of good with the supply chain. You can make a lot of changes. You can reduce carbon emissions. They're really good. But then you start to run against some pretty hard choices. And if you, you know, if, you, if you're looking at making an investment of 100 million pounds on a steel mill, you've got to be pretty sure you're going to get that return on investment. And if you can't charge more, frankly, for the more the greener product at the end of the day, because it's the same as some cheap Chinese steel, that's a really hard choice to make. And so the market forces need to be there to drive people down that route. So there are lots of things there that are sat at a level which are, are kind of lab, lab bench. This is a really good idea, but the the economic case behind it needs to be realized. And so it's kind of this chicken and egg. And I think, frankly, we don't have 100 years to wait for this to happen. We have probably 10. And so we need to fundamentally change how we engage with it. With and ben, just to check, I understand what you mean in that 10. What has to happen in 10 years for this to happen? Oh, well, so um, average life of, say, a brick kiln is 40 years. Average life of a float glass line is 20 years. Um, if we're going to get to net zero by 2050, assuming we're going to go down that route, You've got to be in the planning process now. And, and that is the scary thought, is we don't have 30 years to wait for this stuff. We have 10 years to get it down to a point where we can start to do something sensible in this space. And that is, that's the scary thought that nobody's really realised yet. And I, it's, it's so exciting to work in this space because there's so much to go at. And, you know, uh, uh, having, you know having Charles from Scottish Power Online telling the same thing, uh, that this is, this is where we want to go is, is really, really key. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like all opportunity, but a massive challenge to be able to grab the opportunity. And we'll come on to this idea of opportunity, because I think there is this is basically a very positive you know, um, discussion I think we will have. It's just how to grab the opportunity. But Kirsty, let's come to you. Um, so your business um, did kind of the same thing as Scottish Power and that you, you, you uh, saw the wind of change, um, to use that analogy again, pretty early on. Can I just ask again, why did you choose to do that? And, you know, how did you, choose, what worked best? All the different things you've done, because you talked about a number of initiatives you've taken to make yourself, you know, carbon negative, actually. Yeah. Why did you do it and what worked best? Well, so I think there's something that's quite unique about the mindset of uh, uh, an SME business. It's a different entity entirely from Scottish Power and Iberdrola and, and many of the other players in the renewables market. Um, I think there's a certain uh, a certain element of masochism to running an SME because you need to be small and nimble and absolutely tenacious and you, you have to have an energy that will see you through tough times. You won't necessarily have the support structure and the teams who can investigate different aspects. But the point is, is that I think uh, we have an inherent commerciality in Scotland. We have a real business head to us. Many, many businesses like ourselves are looking for the ways in which they can make a difference. So for us, it's a very simple thing. It felt like the right thing to do. So you're reading the Paris Agreement and do, you're thinking, you mean, oh, um, sorry, Kirsty, do you mean it felt like the right thing to do from a business opportunity point of view? Or was it more of a kind of staff mm -hmm. sentiment? Where did it come oh, from? Lovely. What a great question. Thank you, Stuart. So in lots of levels, uh, we work with a team of environmental scientists. Largely, I'm the only fraud as an environmental lawyer. Everybody else is, is, is basically inured in the science behind everything that we do. And they're specialists that they come to this craft 
genuinely caring and genuinely wanting to make a difference. So I think there was an internal pressure, uh, both David and myself, the directors, have, um, I mean, I chose to work in environmental law before it was a thing, um, and then he worked for Scottish Power in the um, ecology, running the ecology sort of unit there at the time. And, and basically, it's something that just is, 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 well, I suppose you could say it's an ethics thing, but I think it goes far deeper than that. We're beyond ethics here. If you look at boardroom discussions, ESG is on everybody's everybody's roster, everyone's plate. It's, it's, it's boardroom discussions. It's actually the finance world is alive to this. Mark Carney is talking about a carbon market. He's looking to bring this on. So we can talk about how difficult it is and so forth, but ultimately the market will determine that all this um, embedded carbon so we could look at products and we look at buying an electric vehicle, even an electric vehicle has a carbon footprint. So, so we're just coming alive to all of this, but there are many excellent businesses who are already in this space and they are leading the charge and I would absolutely not want to be behind. So I think that comes back to my initial point, which is it's just inherent in the way you run a business. Uh, you either want to be a little bit uncomfortable, uh, on, you know, because you're pushing all the time. Um, and, and I think that just is something that just comes to us quite naturally as a business. Our team ask the questions of us as well. And I'm, I'm proud to, to say that this has actually led to us recruiting some truly excellent people who are asking in interviews, what else are you doing? And what, and, and, what were yeah. uh, that's that's really helpful because just just quickly of all the stuff you did very quickly what worked best for us um the electric vehicles because it's 94 percent of our carbon emissions comes from vehicle usage uh, so introducing the electric vehicles has been without doubt the toughest decision because it does involve a change and a uh, change is something that people take a and week you enforce time to adapt the change to. or was it voluntary we persuade persuade excellent work excellent work so Kirsty, thank you. i'm going to come back to you Kirsty, but i want to then build on this so david i'm going to come back to you and mm -hmm. for those of you putting in questions by the way i'm not ignoring them i will come to them i'm going to go one more series of questions around first with the panel and then we'll come to the questions so david um listening there there's a supplier an sme view of the world and, and perhaps an enlightened one it sounds like it but you talked about you don't want to you don't want to put too much duress in the supply chain. You know, it's kind of a balance of phasing and timing. And so, you know, isn't there a point at which actually, you know, you do need the supply chain to get on with it? It's kind of remember our core question, decarbonizing the supply chain. How do we do it? Well, actually, if we leave it to the voluntary, we'll do that when we think it's right, when our staff force us or when our shareholders force us. It's too late. And actually, this we actually need the demand to come not just from government signals, but also from key domestic end users, uh, arguably. And uh, so at what point does this become uh, a responsibility to say, oh, sorry, supply chain, now you've got to do it? I think, um, I mean, I said before in my introduction that the, 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 the standards that we develop are voluntary. So yeah, they're, they're, they're not mandated, although they can be referenced in, in contracts. And, and obviously that would be, in a way, to Kirsty's point, in a way that becomes a pretty strong um, stick approach rather than the carrot. Um, and and obviously yes, they can get referenced in, in regulation. So for example, the you know the energy savings opportunity scheme that's been running in the UK for large large corporates rather than SMEs is um, a standard such as the ISO for energy management is referenced as a means to comply with that. So I would say that what we do is is in the mix there in where regulation and I guess pressure from consumers and pressure from other stakeholders can be can leaning into this debate can be used i mean i'm not quite sure if i'm answering your question i suppose no, because it's so, not, and, it, it's no, and this is the problem i think and charles same question to you yeah. um again it's a different balancing act right and you're, you're also kind of in this place of we need to do yeah. it but we want to bring people along with us yeah correct because if we because if we don't bring them we don't have a supply chain right yeah so um, so I guess where are we at just now? So of our supply base of what three thousand or thereabouts, we are currently mainly targeting about the top two hundred and fifty, right? And so it's about data collection at this point and saying, right, where are you on decarbonisation and broad environmental aspects? Where are you on social aspects? Where are you on governance? And can I ask we, just very quickly, Charles? Are you doing that with a face-to-face -face sort of roundtable things, or is so, it you just sending no, so an email? So how, so the, part, how serious so part, and important is that yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so before any contract award of a of a certain size, we will go through that process as part of the tender, right? And if you score lowly on that just now, 
it doesn't mean you're out of the running. You can still get the contract, but it comes with a discussion on your scoring isn't good enough. You know, next time this contract comes around or next time in a few years when you're looking at something, we will expect more of you. And, you know, we will then work with the suppliers on developing some sort of improvement plan. And that can be a number of aspects. So, you know, they might not have a policy on modern slavery. So we've got a couple of template policies that we can we can help and support with. Of course, it's not just about the policy, it's buying into it, but it's a starting point. If it's on EVs, a great opportunity, you know, a great example. And this is where we can also be the customer of the supplier because we can help with charge points, we can help with some of those other energy efficient pieces with, with Scottish Power, but of course, you know, without an obligation, but being able to give that advice. So it's about understanding and baselining where a supplier is just now and helping them take them forward to be better in the and future. And have you got, um, Charles, a, yeah. a, are you in your mind thinking next year we're going to ramp this up? Or, or does this have a schedule yet in terms of when does this move from you've got another chance to you've lost your chance? Yeah, so so it's, so it's going, to, it's going to ramp up every year, right? And I think, you know, the ramp up next year will probably be we take it from the top 250 to the top 500 or the top 750, right? But I, I don't think there's the maturity yet for us to be able to, you know, in a hard line way, start to exclude suppliers on certain aspects, right? Mm, of course, if there are huge red flags around bribery and corruption, that sort of thing, absolutely. But I think the decarbonisation piece is, is very much about helping people yeah. improve. And decarbonisation is not yet a huge red flag by implication. And I know no, that's not right, what but, it, it, but it's, but and yet it's sort of, it's kind of, isn't it? At what point? Well, we, is well, it well I would rather, I would rather help a supplier to to go on the journey of decarbonisation rather than to put a red light in front of them and not contract with them in the future. Yeah. So I, I think. I jump in on that if you want. I can. I think yeah, and well, Ben, I was going to come to you with a, with a with a building question on that, which is, so, isn't is it government in the end then that has to get the whole industry saying it's huge red flag time, both top down, bottom up, because it is tough, isn't it, to put the responsibility on major end users who, at the end of the day, they don't coordinate their timing and their documentation and their messaging and the language they use. So, from a supply chain company, it's going to feel extremely complicated and disconnected if different companies at different times start saying this is now the time this is what it has to look like so is it more organizations like yours that have to start providing you know the the schedule and the preferred innovations and so on so i think it's, it's kind of um to, to, to put it in the middle it's the middle risk so i so i'll give you the example and i'll, and I'll kind of come and answer the question directly so the example is is Diageo, who are um, they produce uh, uh, very nice whiskies, I think, and uh, and Guinness and, th and things like that. They were so Gumma gave them and um, one of their glass manufacturers a grant to produce zero carbon glass. So Diageo end customer wanted zero carbon glass bottles. They knew they couldn't produce it, so they worked with their with one of their major bottlers um, with some funding from government to de-risk that innovation process to give them a product. And actually, if you go to go to a uh, go um, on in an aer airplane. <laughs> Chances would be fine thing. Um, then you can um, then you can buy quite expensive zero carbon glass bottle whiskey in airports. Now, why did that work? Well, it wasn't government. It wasn't industry in its own right, and it wasn't the supply chain. It was that partnership. So it's really important that the end users are absolutely and totally engaged. You see this more and more. Volvo talking around zero carbon steel. Diageo, another example, and I heard, uh, I think it was BMW as well, they were talking on zero carbon steel in their cars, is you get the end user who wants to do it, but the gap there is where government needs to come in. The gap is for government to say, right, this is where you are and this is where you need to be. We know you've got the end customers, but the risk associated with that transition is too much. It's not about financing forever and a day. It's about supporting them in that transition piece, and that's where we would come in. So we would, and, and this is basically what I'm going to spend the next five years into 10 years of my life doing is talking to their end customers, getting them in a room, getting them to agree to some voluntary agreement, and then using the supply chain in order to meet those, uh, those, those uh, the standards that are there. And I use the word right. standards very broadly there because it could be yeah. everything from formal standards through to, uh, through to uh, voluntary agreements. And uh, David, from your point of view, is this is this then where you where suddenly it's all going to make sense for you in terms of where you fit in or... Or yeah, I think so. Like, just, yours is, as you say, it's a voluntary process as well. It so, is. But it I'm needs to be a mandated voluntary process, doesn't it? 
Well, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I was going to make the, 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 picking up on what Charles said, perhaps it's a really bad example of, of another industry, because obviously it's not one that's driven by market forces as such. But, you know, we know, for example, there are standards in, in, in education and schools that Ofsted therefore will go in and inspect. And a certain school could be in special measures. Another one is deemed to be improving. And I think what when Charles was talking about the, the way in which they work with suppliers, that he's prepared to say, I think I'm putting words in your mouth a bit, Charles, but saying, actually, I can see you are on a journey of improvement regarding, for example, you know, GHG management. Therefore, that's a good sign rather than you actually taking your eye off the ball. Yeah. What I want to do, what I want to do, Dave, just because we've got, we've only got 50 minutes, yeah, yeah, sure. I want to bring in Kirsty here. Kirsty, so you're listening to all this as one of those SMEs. You're very well prepared. But from your point of view, what do you think government and end, major end users should do to bring the whole industry along faster? Or do you feel like it's going at the right pace? Okay, um, so I think the point was made earlier that it's the wrong time to ask the question, possibly by, by David. So I think generally the point to make is that there's a lot of companies that aren't here anymore because of what's happened with COVID. We can't change that, but there are other companies who've come through this and who are in good shape. So I think the point being is, um, we know with Scottish Power asking the first 250, you can ask the question of more people. You can ask the question, you can start the discussion. It's odd to um, for an SME to be pushing more, but um, I think the point is there's a climate emergency, right? So this um, there is a tendency for us to want to get it right for everybody, and I think you can genuinely be paralysed by perfection. Uh, I think that if we try to look for um, a new system and con continuity and consistency, my God, I would love it, but we don't have it at the moment. So there's no change with that. I speak as an SME who, for one client, will have maybe three portals I need to use just to bill. Um, so I, I think the experience of the SME is, you know, we're used to being asked, we're used to being, well, always having to raise the bar. And that's the nature of the beast. And I think that you can ask the question of more people. That's not to say that you necessarily need to wait it. I don't know all the procurement laws and outs with that. But genuinely, if you were to say to people, what are you doing? That the question I would just say, if, if every developer client listening into this was just to say to people, what are you doing to reduce your climate footprint? that's enough ask the question and then people will go away going well how do i know and you, you then direct them to the carbon trust which is free and will calculate your carbon footprint for free and will give you tips on how to manage your footprint for free so there is a time element involved i understand mm -hmm. that but you know there's a learning curve for us when cybersecurity became a hot topic and clearly our cybersecurity, <laughs> caused by my extreme buildings and hanging a boot on the phone there earlier is, is you know we've gone through that process and we've learned as a business people will do the same companies are the entrepreneurs entrepreneurial spark is just really strong in Scotland, I think, certainly, right? And I think that you can ask the question to stimulate discussion, and that will generate progress. And it will help to, 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 to raise everyone's game to this net zero goal that we're talking about. I think being scared to ask the question because you're scared of asking too much of a supplier is lovely, but we already answer many, many questions as part of procurement, okay? So this is just another piece, and there's help available. The wonderful thing that would be the link here is the likes of Charles, who um, uh, I think uh, I think the, the Charles mentioned that they're, they're, I mean, gosh, they've they've gone first. They're our first questionnaire we had. The Scottish government have asked us questions about this as well. It's going to happen. So I think I would always want to be on the front foot with that. So. Um, uh, if there's help available for things like the fraud conversation and you talked about child slavery, I think Charles there an information sheet on where to go for this would be wonderful and, and it would take no time at all for Scottish Power and other developers yeah. and to, yeah. to issue. And Kirsty, what I'm going to do, thank you for that. Um, so as I think it's a relatively polite way of saying let's get a move on um, and uh, which yeah and I think that and I, when I look at other industries they have gone faster than the energy industry uh, and I think that's been touched on a bit by David as well. So let's now move on to the questions. We have lots of great questions. And I think if we can go for sort of like 20 second answers. So Charles, there's one here from Paul Cantwell, uh, which is what programs or activities are being run in organization to identify local supply chain developments. Um, so what activities are there in asset management to support net zero practice? You see that question? Yeah, yeah, I see it. So I mean, look, yeah, a huge amount of our supply chain is local, right? I think we calculate about 70% of our of the contracts we let are effectively 
um, UK content, so whether it's a domestic supplier or services delivered by an overseas supplier but delivered in the UK, so a huge amount within that. I think as a Glasgow boy, I'd love to see more Glasgow suppliers, Scottish suppliers, British suppliers in there. Um, and we'll always look to work with them as, as much as possible. Yeah, and it's similar to the Eric Lisbon, um, I don't know, sorry, Eric, if I didn't respond, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name right. Uh, similar question here about, yeah, isn't decarbonizing linked with developing a local supply chain? Do you, do you think also anybody in the panel that this is also linked to a UK content or a Scottish content requirement? Anybody so, want to so, comment on that? Or is that a scary thing to contemplate? So the interesting thing about um, supply chains is about... Uh, that the length of supply chain usually doesn't affect the carbon footprint. It's largely, it's actually making this stuff in the first place where all the environmental impact is. So shipping things around the world doesn't actually generate that much carbon. It's, it's how it's manufactured. So um, the important thing is, is if you want to do it in a low carbon economy, so if you do it somewhere where you have lots of dirty um, coal-fired power stations, that's really bad. Whereas if you do it somewhere where it's all, um, you know, um, a wind wave or nuclear, that's where you get much better environmental impact. So actually, we, if we can control that by having a local supply chain, that's good as long as the local energy systems that produce them are decarbonized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's strong support from two of the panelists on local supply chain. That's very encouraging. I think everybody listening in, if you're part of a cluster and you haven't joined it, if you're located in the cluster region, you should join that cluster. Um, and because uh, there's a lot of benefit to be had there. Um, David, how can you influence suppliers to adopt new greener processes when in post-COVID world, costs are constrained and businesses are struggling? How are you seeing that? Because you're working across so many sectors. It's not just an energy question. It's, how, do we, yeah, how do we force companies to get a move on, even though they've got excuses to say, I can't afford it right now? Yeah, but I think in a way, Kirsty sort of touched upon this a little bit, and you were pushing her as to what the motivation was. Our survey, the barometer I talked about, found that cost was always a barrier, particularly for SMEs, because it's like, can we can we afford to invest in something that we that we, we we know ultimately will actually pay back, but it requires that sort of big payout earlier. Um, I think in a way, I think what what what's what's probably happening, and Kirsty has again alluded to this, is the fact that there, there becomes that kind of immovable force that you actually have to make these changes and. Actually, you will see that the re you'll recoup that investment, but also you'll you'll acquire so many other benefits by by being able to you know um, bid for, for more contracts and maybe find new markets and new customers as well. So the so business I think opportunity. Is I think it has saying. to be that ultimately. People should just see that opportunity. Yeah, it kind of seems to come either from the business opportunity or from that values or beliefs aspect within the business yeah. or a in government the same, or in the same way companies demand. have reinvented themselves as a result of the pandemic i think in a way they're going to over the next 10 years before 10 years have to reinvent their model to accommodate those changes yeah. and david also there's a question here from kate colchester which is uh, quite a technical question designing standards for the uk do you refer to pri or tcfd or any other international agency uh given that international investors are focused on these standards what do you recommend small businesses um, very quick question yeah, yeah very I, quick I think, answer a very quick answer is that I know there are lots of different organizations developing codes, protocols in, in, in sustainability reporting and and the like. What I think is probably going to happen over the next year or so is there's going to be a lot more convergence in that space because I think it's confusing the market in a way with different types of measures. So from a supply chain point of view today, what do they do? Um, I can't really answer that question yeah. directly. So I there don't isn't have, a, have there isn't I don't a great have the answer. Knowledge, the technical yeah. knowledge that Kate probably has on that. One. No worries, Sorry. that's okay. Uh, Mike Shepherd, Alderley asks, um, and Kirsty, I'll come to you on this one. Uh, could the supply chain have their products graded by their full CO two footprint, uh, similar to the food industry? So it's kind of starting to yeah rate and and have a KPI around good performers, bad performers, isn't it? And uh, this is a little bit around, of course, carbon taxes as well in terms of rating yep. those countries that are further ahead than others through the tax scheme. What's your view on that? I think that's a really exciting proposition. I realise in saying that it's a little bit controversial, but the embodied carbon isn't fully understand when we're making that decision to buy something. So we've just got there with, you know, um, you've talked about labelling and so forth, and there's been some fantastic developments that have happened in that space. I think if people were aware of um, the full embodied carbon in their decision making process, it would enable them and it would enable the marketplace to make the correct decisions or at least to make informed decisions. Um, correct suggests a judgment with that. And, and, and the, 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 the truth of all of this is, is if we start to look at the embodied carbon costs in a product, um, I genuinely think that people would start to, um, th there is a cost, um, which I think some of the questions, I can't see which ones, sorry, there's quite a few of them on the screen. Yeah. 
but there was a question about how you um it's not not an easy decision for people necessarily to make a choice about a, a purchase or a service and um, where it costs more so i mean we have as a business spent somewhere in the region of 290,000 on pursuing this particular project of ours to be net zero beyond to be carbon negative and um, we have we can do that not everybody can, um, but you know, there's no rewards in the procurement system because if the weighting is, for example, based on price rather than um, you know what you're doing in terms of your carbon footprint, um, that the, the reward isn't necessarily there. So it can feel a little bit brave investing that kind of money, but you don't need to spend that kind of money here. So I think um, I'm taking on a slight tangent if I may, but there are quick wins that people can have to make a start now and i think if we, we, we sort of wait to sort of get something that is um the full piece um i think for small businesses that's really difficult so um so yeah i'm sorry i went i went a wee wander through the park there Stuart. back to you no that's okay and i think um, can i say Stuart, on that one about about yeah, lazing i think there just needs to be a lot of um clarity consistency so that's my very first point about trust there because you know if we if we have a situation where there are multiple different labels which indicate whether a product is carbon neutral carbon positive that's just going to again create more consumer confusion i mean i can think of two very strong brands on coffee that one is about biodiversity preservation one is about supporting a, a, a cocoa bean farmer by giving him a better price for the cocoa they're both very worthy and noble but it could lead to confusion by which one's more important and David, the, the, you're right, and yet the truth is those companies that have a higher percentage of green in their portfolio typically have better share price ratios than no, no, those that don't. So it is really happening today. And so the, at some point, I think companies are going to get pressure to do this. And I think we have really three or four minutes left. Uh, thank you to all those that have submitted your questions. We've covered quite a few of them. Uh, any others that we didn't get to? Uh, I'm sure if you contact any of the speakers afterwards, um, they're all on LinkedIn, of course, or the organizers connect you with them, then they will try and answer the questions. What I'm going to ask everybody to do now is just to give a 30 second sort of closing salvo on how they would summarize what we've talked about and kind of what they would take forward. Charles, I'll start with you. Um, OK, so I mean, just very briefly, look, you know, we're going to work with the supply chain. We're going to ask them to do more. And in a few years time, we're going to expect even more than what we're asking today. So, you know, this is a journey we want to work with everyone on, but the journey starts now. It doesn't start tomorrow. So do everything you can as soon as you can, not just in decarbonisation, but everything around ESG. So it sounds like a tightening. Even in the period of this last hour, the, the messaging is tightening. The time scale is tightening. And I think that feels right, OK, doesn't it? That we're, we're all trying to go in the right pace, but someone has to set the pace. And I think definitely major end users who've been in this business, you know, from your heart and your mind for the last 15 years, I think we would listen to you if you if you accelerate the pace. So that makes a lot of sense to me. David, uh, your 30 second closing. In a few seconds. Yeah. I mean, we often say that the world of standards is about collaboration, innovation, acceleration. I think, again, someone mentioned it probably was Kirsty, actually, that that C word collaboration, I think, is so important. So particularly for SMEs working within that supply chain. It's about reaching out to local organizations, local enterprise partnerships, chambers of commerce, FSB chapters, et cetera, et cetera, because people are going to be in the same situation as you. And actually, again, it's where you can acquire new business opportunities through that. And I think what PSI is doing and needs to do more of actually is work with those different networks to kind of cascade that knowledge that we have out through those different channels so that it can be picked up and utilized as well. And I, we do actually have an SME um, little book of net zero, which is available on that same website I mentioned before, which provides some top tips for, for SMEs. Yes, uh, I think you're spot on. I think the collaboration, whether it's voluntary or mandated, is now absolutely critical because energy, by definition, is now almost every, heavy, every heavy, um, heavy industry now has to decarbonize. So almost everybody's in the energy game suddenly. And that that is a task, Ben, that uh, is challenging for all of us. And we have to learn and work together and help each other. So your closing remarks, please. Yes, yeah, so, so um, I think really just to say um, I have been amazingly working in sustainability for 20 years um, um, and it really does feel that the only last three years that the world has suddenly woken up this idea on the very senior level that this is really really important and 
we are, I think we're approaching the eye of the storm where you're going to be on one of two sides, whether you are really engaged in this or you're not. And so we've got to help make that transition happen as quickly as possible. And I am, I am optimistic about the way the world is going. Yeah. Next. And you've got to be brave, I think, now as a business leader to not decide to engage in this, both from the negative point of view of your customers are going to demand it, but also the positive point of view. There's opportunities everywhere if you just look at the writing on the wall, look at the winds of change. Kirsty, could you close us out, please, with your words of wisdom? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I think there's just two sort of, well, there's two audiences here, the buyer and the supplier. For the buyer, I would just say, don't be afraid to ask the question. Um, you can influence change very easily by looking to your supply chain. But also, if you can do that in a way that is supportive, I think there is a, you know, it, it takes a it takes a village. I keep saying this. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a, a village to run a business. So look to your your colleagues in, in, the, in the marketplace and see what people are doing, learn. And, and and so for the buyer, if you can set out milestones, which mean that it's achievable for the SMEs in your supply chain, you'll be helping people to do something that they probably want to do. It's just that sometimes a little nudge is required. For suppliers, if you've not started, we share on our website how we did it. So there's other ways you can do it. Um, but call the Carbon Trust, measure your footprint. Once you know what you're doing, once you know what your impact is on the planet, then you can look to to mitigate it, to manage it down. Um, and and so those are my two calls there. Thank you, right, Kirsty. And, and that brilliant closing words. And we are out of time. Thank you so much to a wonderful panel. I think it's been a really, really interesting discussion. We have moved things forward, I think, even in this one hour. What a time it is to move things forward. And with that, Judith, I hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I was going to say my thank yous backstage. So I think we now have to bring things to a halt and then I shall gush even more. But audience, your questions will be looked at. We will circulate them to the panel. Uh, do please also recommend watching On Demand. And we will be covering this topic again live at All Energy 11th and 12th of May next year. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, all. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart.